Oh, hey guys. That sounded super creepy, didn't it? Um, okay, well, looks like we're live. I think I'm gonna go with we're live. Um, so, hello. It's Tuesday, 7 p.m. Central, wherever you are in the world. Um, and Sonny Brigham, uh, board certified clinical and integrative nutritionist. Uh, and basically, let me silence the old telephono here. Uh, basically what I do is I help individuals um, reduce their fatigue, eliminate their bloat, and lose weight because that's what most people want is to lose weight. Um, and really it comes with getting the imbalances in the body corrected so that we can figure out why the body, you know, is hanging on to the weight that it is, and then we can start uh, losing some from there. So uh, tonight we talk soy. Um, I know that uh, at one point I was super confused when it comes to soy. I used to think that it was um, really bad, and then I thought it was really good, and then I thought I don't know what the hell that I think. Um, and so I know that uh, when my husband and I started dating, he was very anti-soy because he thought, you know, it was going to give him man boobs. Um, and so there seems to be a lot of conflicting information out there when it comes to soy. I mean, all it takes is for you to Google it and you can see, you know, you can just Google is soy good or is soy bad and you're going to come up with like the first page of Google is going to be conflicting article after conflicting article. Um, some people are basing their opinion off of shoddy science. Um, yes, science is good, but not all clinical trials are really well formulated or done properly. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about, but we're get out of there. We'll talk a little bit about um, some of the articles that I use, the research that I look at to formulate um, my own opinion and things that I use in my clinical practice. So um, as we go forth and chat all about soy, um, if you have any questions, you can post them in the comments below. And I'm assuming that you see them below. That's why I'm doing this doggy paddle thing. Um, that's my typing hands. Um, you know, some people have knife hands. These are my typing hands. Um, so if you have uh, questions, you can go ahead and post them below. And as we go through, I will come back and check the comments and make sure that you get your questions answered. I've got my spectacles tightened recently and uh, tightened them a little too hard. I feel like they're squeezing my brain out the top. So I have to get those adjusted again. And the camera is crooked. Let's fix that because that's going to annoy me. All right. Well, let's proceed. Okay. So I have linked the blog. If you haven't read the blog uh, and you're interested to learn a little bit about a little more about soy, go ahead and read the blog um, because in these talks, I basically just give you like a super quick rundown. I try to keep it super quick, but sometimes I talk a lot. Um, and so uh, if I didn't touch on something that you're interested in knowing or I touched on it very briefly, but you want to read a little bit more about it, definitely look at the blog because you're going to see some more information there. Okay. So uh, I think two of like the biggest concerns about soy is, is it going to increase your estrogen or mess with your hormones? And will it give you man boobs if you're a dude? Um, and so that's kind of what the blog is really focused around. Um, I'll just give you my opinion right now. So I was anti-soy, I was pro-soy, I was I don't know what I am, and I am very pro-soy, especially after, you know, diving into the research and really looking at good quality studies versus bad studies and what some of the studies were based off of, and I'll talk to you about that here in just a second. Um, so soy's bad rep is really unjustified. Soy is good, eat soy, we'll talk about uh, which soys are really good to have. Um, and then if you're interested, we can talk a little bit about ways to incorporate it in your diet, if I remember, because I didn't put that in the blog. Okay, so let's see. So if you don't know, soybean crops are on the rise in the U.S. Right now, they're the second largest crop that we grow right behind corn. Um, and soy is rising because it is cheap. So when they take the soybean uh, and they crush it, they basically separate the oil from the, the, the pulp or the bean or the meal. The oil goes to make margarine, vegetable oils, lubricants for cars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the meal goes to animal feed. 
So if you're anti-soy, but you eat grain-fed animals, basically factory farmed animals, you're eating soy because the animals are fed soy, soy is what feeds their body, and you are eating their body, so you are eating soy. Um, so if you're anti-soy and you're eating factory farmed animals, you're not really avoiding soy. Um, it's important to note that about 80% of the soy crops in the U.S. are genetically modified. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about GMOs in this uh, Facebook Live or blog because that's kind of a slippery slope to go down. There's a lot of information. Um, and some people favor, feel very strongly about being pro-GMO or anti-GMO. So I just kind of threw that out there for you. I also linked a really nice article from NPR about GMOs. Um, and so if you're interested in reading a little bit more about that, it's kind of in the second or third paragraph. And it says, if you're interested in reading about herbicide and incesticides use in GMO crops, this is a good article to peruse. So I would definitely take a look at that. Um, okay, so when we look at research, animal studies are very often used um, when it comes to determining whether something is good for humans or not. It's a baseline for when we start medication trials, they always test new medication on animals, mainly mice and rats. Um, so they test it on animals first, they kind of get an idea of what they need to do with it, tweak it before they can actually go into human trials. And so just like everything else, when we're talking about different dietary mechanisms, when we talk about genes and how they express and environment and everything, a lot of our studies are based on animal studies. Um, and so it's important to note that while that is fine when we talk about a lot of different things, that is not okay when it comes to soy. And the reason being is that mice do not metabolize soy in the, main, in the same manner that humans do. Um, and so any study that you read that's very soy is bad, soy is the worst thing ever, and it's done on mice, and it's because mice metabolize soy in a very different way, and all studies surrounding soy and mice all take a turn for the worse. But when we look at soy and human studies, it's completely different. So all of the studies that I referenced today are all human studies. They've all been conducted within the last five years, which is really important because science is continually changing. And they're all reviews, and I've talked about this before. So um, somebody sits down or a group of scientists sit down and they pull in all the research on one particular topic, they go through it all, they take out ones that are biased or ones that are poorly designed or ones that the research group wasn't large enough, and then they have what's left over and they look at everything, they compare the goods, the bads, the uglies, and then they come up with an opinion based on those leftover studies. And so those are really good studies to look at. So everything today is last five years, human-based and peer-reviewed. Okay. So with that, let us dive in. So soy contains components called isoflavones. And so these isoflavones are, um, they have a similar molecular structure to estrogen. So when you look at like an estradiol molecule and you look at an isoflavone molecule, they look fairly similar. Um, and so this is why they say that soy has an estrogenic effect on the body, because soy can actually attach to estrogen receptors. They don't act as estrogen in the body, but when they attach to the estrogen receptors, the body thinks that there is extra estrogen, and so it kind of goes on like that. So uh, some people are very, very sensitive to phytoestrogens, or foods that act like estrogen. Um, Flax is a phytoestrogen, so um, if you're concerned about soy and the estrogen effect, then I would hope that you're also concerned about flax and the estrogen effect because they're both phytoestrogens. There's a lot of herbs out there that are also phytoestrogens. Um, and so, they, like I said, they don't actually increase estrogen, but they do act like estrogen when they attach to the estrogen receptors in the body. Um, so it's important to note, so uh, isoflavones are plural, there's a lot of them in the body, uh, or there's a lot of them in soy, and most of them are very beneficial. Uh, and isoflavones are also known as selective estrogen receptor modulators, or SERMs. 
Uh, and like I said, the reason that they're called that is because they attach to estrogen receptors in the body. Um, common cancer medications, especially for like breast cancer, tamoxifen is also a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And so tamoxifen um, attaches to estrogen receptors in the body the same way that soy does. Um, and so being an SCRM is not a bad thing. Uh, isoflavones have different effects. Um, estrogen, so isoflavones or phytoestrogens, foods that act like estrogen. So estrogen actually stimulates vaginal tissue growth, whereas isoflavones do not because they are not actually estrogen. Um, some feel the estrogenic effects of soy because soy binds to estrogen receptors, but it's not actually acting in the same manner that estrogen does. There are a small group of people that are very sensitive to phytoestrogens. Um, flax will cause them to feel like they have too much estrogen in the body. Soy may do the same thing. But for the most part, the majority of the population, they are not very sensitive to phytoestrogens. It's just like anything else. I might be able to eat corn, but the next person next to me may not be able to tolerate it. Um, it's all about knowing your body and knowing what's normal. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's get to, I know that was a really weird stretch, sorry. Um, soy's role in breast cancer. And so I think this goes into the fear of soy being an estrogen or acting like an estrogen in the body. A lot of people think that soy is going to cause breast cancer or things like that. Uh, but what we actually find is that soy is actually protective against breast cancer, and it doesn't actually feed into breast cancer, which is a lot of people think. And so again, this is coming from a variety of studies, and I have them all linked in the blog if you're interested in reading them. Um, so basically, let's see, let me find the information. Okay, so here's one review, right? So I talked about peer-reviewed. So I have one peer-reviewed study that looked at 100 different studies over the years relating to soy and breast cancer. Every study that was done in a human showed a decrease in breast cancer risk and development amongst individuals that consumed soy on a regular basis. So, uh, soy doesn't really cause breast cancer and soy uh, can actually be breast cancer protective, so reducing your risk. Um, dietary patterns and environmental concerns probably play, play a larger role in breast cancer development. Um, Asians have the lowest risk of breast cancer and they are actually the highest consumer of soy. However, when Asians migrate or move from uh, Asia to Europe or to uh, America and they start to take on the type of diets that we eat, especially in America, their risk for breast cancer increases greatly. And that's because they have completely changed their diet from what is native to Japan or to China or to Thailand or anything like that. And now they're eating very highly processed foods, lots of takeout. Um, box dinners, those sorts of things. And so a lot of it goes into, are we eating the processed foods? Are we not moving enough? And what type of environment are we living in? So that makes a big, that has a bigger impact on um, development of breast cancer than soy intake. So soy is protective against breast cancer and does not feed into cancer. So let's talk about prostate cancer because I don't think that a lot of people equate, oh, hey, Kelly. Um, I don't think a lot of people equate soy with prostate cancer, right? Because when we think about soy and we think about estrogen, immediately we think about the boobs, right? Um, we don't really think about men and their prostate. And so there is a lot of information out there on soy and prostate cancer um, because uh, breast cancer, if we take away the genetic aspect of it, so you're talking about the BRCA and the HERS genes, and we go strictly with what the rest of breast cancer majority, majority, the majority, more, I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say because clearly I can't say that word. Uh, the, let me find another word for it. The, um, uh, the majority, oh, there it is. The majority of breast cancer or, uh, is estrogen dominant. Uh, you know, it comes from too much estrogen, which happens when we are overweight, which happens when we have a poor diet. Um, and so prostate is the male equivalent to breast cancer. It is an androgen dependent organ. So the prostate depends on testosterone. And so when there is not enough of it or there's too much of it, 
it's causing some imbalance in the prostate. And so soy uh, can actually be protective against the development of prostate cancer. Um, and so we looked at some studies there and soy is not going to help put prostate cancer in remission. Um, it is not going to reduce PSA levels, so the prostate antigen uh, hormones. It's not going to reduce that. But consuming soy early in life can actually be uh, prostate preventative or prostate cancer preventative. So it can reduce an individual's risk of developing prostate cancer. So soy is not uh, bad for the boobs and it's not bad for the prostate either. I was going to say it's not bad for the, never mind, I'll keep it clean. Let's see, I think I saw a question. Oh, hi, Kelly's cousin Deb from Alberta, Canada. Thanks for joining us. Uh, oh, Kelly had a question. She said, are you saying diet is impacting breast cancer? I know several women with breast cancer that are vegan, great eaters. Yes, so when we talk diet, we're not talking um, just the foods that you're putting in. We're also talking about the lifestyle that you lead, right? So are you, oh, you can be a vegan, but you can be super ridiculously stressed out, right? Um, and so stress is going to have a huge impact on the hormones in your body as well. Um, so it's really lifestyle overall. Are you taking care of yourself? Are you sleeping enough? Are you de-stressing enough? Are you eating enough? Are you getting enough sunshine? It's lifestyle overall. And then we look at the environment that we live in. Um, so do we live in a very industrialized area that has poor air quality? Um, do we work in factories? So there's a lot of factors that go into it, but yes, diet is a component of it. So even if you eat amazingly well, you can sleep like crap and be super high stressed and really everything that you're doing diet-wise kind of goes out the um, window. Did you see that? I think it belongs to me. Did that answer your question, Kelly? And let's not forget there are obviously genetic link, uh, genetic type breast cancers as well. So you could be vegan, but if you carry the BRCA gene or HERS, there's a good chance that you're still going to develop uh, breast cancer at some point. Okay, so we talked about soy's role in breast cancer. We talked about soy's role in prostate cancer. Now let's talk about some of the other benefits of soy. Um, soy can actually be cardioprotective, and what they found in several studies to show that uh, as much as 25 grams of soy protein daily um, can lower your LDL by 6%, which is a pretty significant amount. Um, it can raise your HDL, which is your good cholesterol, and it can decrease your circulating triglycerides. Um, some studies have shown that it can be hypotensive, meaning it's going to lower your blood pressure. There's not a whole lot of information on that, but there are a couple studies that have shown that. Um, and then soy can be protective against osteoporosis. So while tofu does have calcium, and I have talked about this before, and we do need calcium for, you know, bone health and things like that. So it's not the only thing that we need. There's tons of nutrients that go into bone health, but calcium is important. Um, it's actually the isoflavones that increase bone turnover as we age. And so it helps to pre prevent the development of osteoporosis and it also helps prevent risk fractures if you do have osteoporosis. Um, natto, which is a form of fermented soy, is really high in vitamin K2, which is um, an important nutrient for bones. Okay, and then we've got anti-nutrients. So um, just when I was looking at some of the blogs, uh, that are out there as far as um, soy goes, a lot of them talked about the anti-nutrients that are in soy. So soybeans, it's a legume, which means that it's going to have some lectins and some phytic acid and things like that. And most people know these as foods that tend to aggravate people's digestive tract or foods that bind to nutrients in the body and flush them out. Um, I am not overly concerned about these because there are so many foods that have these. So lectins tend to be the plant's like natural defense. So if it, this plant is kind of growing out in the wild, it's what's going to keep bugs and critters off of it because when these bugs and critters eat it, it's like poison to them. But for us, because we, we cook it, we don't eat soybeans raw. You know, when we cook them and we boil them, the more prepared they are, the less lectins and anti-nutrients that are going to be in the food itself. Um, 
Some people do have digestive issues with beans, and that's perfectly fine. So you would be a person that probably is not going to tolerate soybeans very well, and that's okay. There are people that are sensitive to soy, and they just can't handle soy in their body, and that's okay. We're all different. Um, but I'm not concerned about the anti-nutrients because if we look at spinach, right, there are so many benefits of spinach, right? People eat spinach. It's a great leafy green. It's got tons of nutrients in it. It's high in calcium, but it's got phytic acid in it. And phytic acid is an anti-nutrient that binds to certain nutrients in the body and flushes it out. Does it mean that you should stop eating uh, spinach? No. Just like it doesn't mean that you should stop eating soybeans. It just means that you need to make sure that you're eating a nice, healthy, balanced diet. So and that is pretty much it. It is breast cancer protective. It's prostate cancer protective. Uh, it can be good for the cholesterol levels. Are you snuggling on my animal? I can't do my thing if you're snuggling on my animal. Kids. Uh, and um, I wouldn't be concerned about the anti-nutrients on it. Um, so soy for me personally, I do not consume genetically modified soy if I can help it. Now, obviously, if I'm out in a restaurant and I order soy there, it's probably not going to be um, non-GMO. Uh, but in my house, if I can control it, all of my soy is um, non-GMO. Uh, the easiest way to know whether your soy is GMO or non-GMO is, is it organic. So all organic is non-GMO, but you can have non-organic and it also not be GMO. Um, great options for soy is tofu, if you like it, some people don't. Tempeh, tempeh is a fermented soy product, so it's really good as far as the fermentation goes, so it's gut health, um, gut healthy, and then you also get the benefits of the soy. Miso and natto are also uh, fermented options of soy. And then um, you've got edamame beans. I know a lot of people like edamame. They're a great snack because they're high in protein, healthy carbs, and they've got some yummy fats in them. Um, soys that I tend to stay away from would be soybean oil and soy milk. I don't like those because they are very, very processed. Um, if I once, I don't even know how often I go to Starbucks. I can't even tell you the last time I was there. Um, it's been a while. So if I go to Starbucks and I order like a latte, obviously I order it with soy milk. I'm not going to Starbucks for the health benefits, so I'm not really concerned if their soy is non-GMO or GMO. Um, but if I'm eating soy in my house, I'm going to make sure it's organic, non-GMO soy. Ways to incorporate it in your diet. Edamame is easy. You can get it in the shells, pop it in the microwave for three to four minutes, or boil it in a pot on the stove for four to five minutes. Uh, dump it in a bowl and toss it with some sea salt, and it's a great snack. Um, it helps slow down because you have to eat it out of the pods, um, but that's a really good snack. Um, miso soup, that's always an option. If you're making any type of Asian dish at home, miso paste is a, is a good way to um, add because a lot of seasonings will have miso paste added to it. Um, tempeh is good. You can make tempeh tacos. You can shred it and put it in a lot of different um, – a lot of different dishes. You can uh, put it in spaghetti. Tofu, I like to make tofu scramble for breakfast and put in some turmeric and then some other spices and things like that in it. And so it ends up being a really easy way since I don't eat eggs. It's a really easy way to um, to get uh, eggs in my breakfast, or not eggs, to get vegetables. So it's kind of like having scrambled eggs instead I have uh, tofu scramble. Isn't he so cute? So that is it as far as soy goes. So it's not bad. It's breast cancer protective. It is prostate cancer protective. It's good for the cardiovascular system. Uh, and it's not going to make you grow man boobs. Sorry, guys, if that's what you were kind of looking for. I'm sure there's other ways that you can get that out there. They have enhancements these days. Um, so that is it. I don't see any other questions. Um, but if you're watching this after the fact and you have a question, go ahead and post it below. I'll be more than happy to answer it. Um, and if you haven't read the blog yet, go ahead and check it out. There might be some other information on there that was important that I might have glossed over. And that is it. Thanks for joining me tonight. Let me tell you what we're chatting about next week. Next week, we are chatting about adrenal fatigue. Mm, that's a good one. A lot of people suffer from adrenal fatigue. Uh, 
And the reason I say adrenal fatigue is because it's a bad word for it. It's really called the HPA access dysregulation. And we'll talk all about that um, and how to know whether you have problems with it. But I do know that a lot of people um, uh, that I see in my clinic have some sort of HPA access dysregulation. Oh, yes, the husband said beer gives you man boobs. So, yeah, it was really interesting. I think there needs to be more studies on this. Um, but it was really interesting. So it was just kind of a recent study that came out. It's not peer reviewed, but that a high intake of IPAs, because they're very hoppy, um, can cause an increase in uh, man boobs for lack of gynecomastia is what it's called. Um, because hops tend to be very high in phytoestrogens. Uh, and there's actually kind of like folklore stories um, of way back in the day before uh, machines kind of milled a lot of the crops when you had to go out and hand pick the hops that older women would spontaneously start menstruating regularly again because um, handling the hops caused them to absorb more estrogen um, and so they kind of went back into they kind of went back into premenopausal uh, not a whole lot of research behind that but super interesting but beers in general because of the hops are you know should be limited and the husband says IPAs are for hipsters I think that's a personal opinion um, I don't particularly like IPAs I think they're a little too hoppy for me it's funny he's anti hipster but he's pretty hipster yeah all right well that's it guys I don't see any other questions um, but if you have any after the fact, just let me know, and I will see you next week for adrenal fatigue. Have a good night. Bye.